You probably know that your brain is the control center of your body, the command hub that runs every thought, action, and emotion. It works in a fixed pattern. Every bit of sensory information travels to the brain, gets interpreted, and the brain sends back instructions, so you can respond accordingly. But here's the real question. How is this information actually sent to the brain? What's the language your body uses to communicate within itself? Let's decode the science behind it. So, let's start with the basics. What actually happens is that your body is covered with receptors, tiny structures that work like sensors. They're constantly detecting signals from the environment, whether it's light, sound, touch, temperature, or taste. These environmental changes are called stimuli. Your receptors can sense these stimuli because they contain nerve endings, which are actually the dendrites of sensory neurons. These nerve endings receive the stimuli at the receptor site. The sensory neurons are then connected to each other, forming cable-like structures called nerves. These nerves transmit the signals all the way to the brain, where the information is interpreted, and a suitable message is sent back to the target organ, telling your body how to respond. But the real mystery is this. What happens inside these nerves? How do these electrical signals actually travel from one end to the other? That's where the concept of action potential begins. To understand action potential, let's start with the structure of a neuron. First come the dendrites, branching processes that receive incoming signals. These feed into the cell body, or soma, which contains the nucleus and other organelles that keep the cell alive. From the cell body extends a long, thread-like projection called the axon. Right where the soma meets the axon is a small but crucial region called the axon hillock. Remember this point, because it plays a central role in generating action potentials. The axon is wrapped by the myelin sheath, a fatty covering. At the far end of the axon are the axon terminals, which form synapses with the dendrites of the next neuron. Those synaptic connections are how one neuron passes information to another, but first, we need to see how the electrical signal is born at the membrane. That begins at the axon hillock. Notice one thing, signals are passed through a neuron in the form of electrical charges. That means we're dealing with positive and negative ions. And as you know, when positive and negative charges are separated by a barrier, an electrical potential is created. In the case of a neuron, these charged particles, the ions, are separated by the plasma membrane. This difference in electrical charge across the membrane is called the membrane potential. So, how much membrane potential does a neuron have when it's not transmitting any signal? In its resting state, the outside of the neuron is more positive, while the inside is more negative. This state is known as the resting membrane potential, and in most neurons, it measures around minus 70 millivolts. That's the quiet stage of the neuron like a charged battery waiting to be switched on. Now that the neuron is at rest, let's see what happens when a stimulus arrives. When a receptor detects a strong enough signal, it triggers a small electrical disturbance that reaches the axon hillock, the control point of the neuron. If this disturbance is strong enough to cross a certain limit, known as the threshold potential around minus 55 millivolts, the neuron becomes active. And this is where the real action begins, the action potential. At threshold, voltage-gated sodium channels in the membrane suddenly open. Sodium ions, which are more concentrated outside, rush inside the neuron. As positive sodium ions enter, the inside of the neuron becomes less negative, and soon even positive. This rapid shift is called depolarization. For a brief moment, the neuron's inside becomes about plus 30 millivolts, meaning the polarity has reversed, inside positive, outside negative. Immediately after, those sodium channels close, and potassium channels open. Now potassium ions flow out of the cell, restoring the negative charge inside, a process called repolarization. Sometimes the membrane becomes even more negative than its original resting state. This is known as hyperpolarization, before the neuron returns to its resting potential again. This entire sequence, depolarization, repolarization, and return to rest, happens in just a few milliseconds. 
And that single electrical event is what we call an action potential. Now the question is, how does this electrical signal travel along the neuron? Remember, an action potential starts at one point, usually the axon hillock, but it doesn't stay there. It moves forward along the axon like a wave. When one section of the membrane depolarizes, the nearby region also reaches its threshold, and a new action potential is generated there. In this way, the signal keeps triggering the next segment, one after another, creating a self-propagating wave of electrical activity. This traveling wave of action potentials is what we call a nerve impulse. Notice that the impulse always moves in one direction, from the axon hillock to the axon terminals, because the region behind it is temporarily inactive, a period known as the refractory period. Now, not all neurons conduct impulses at the same speed. Neurons that are wrapped with the myelin sheath transmit signals much faster. That's because the electrical impulse doesn't travel continuously along the entire axon. Instead, it jumps from one node of Ranvier to the next, a process called saltatory conduction. This jumping of impulses saves both time and energy, allowing messages from the brain to reach even the farthest parts of the body within fractions of a second. After an action potential has occurred, after an action potential has occurred, the neuron needs a brief recovery time before it can fire again. This recovery time is known as the refractory period, and it comes in two types. The first is the absolute refractory period. During this phase, no new action potential can be generated, no matter how strong the stimulus is. This happens because the sodium channels are temporarily inactive. Then comes the relative refractory period, when a new action potential can occur, but only if the stimulus is stronger than normal. This ensures that each impulse travels in one direction only, from the axon hillock toward the axon terminals, and prevents signals from moving backward. In simple terms, it's the neuron's brief moment of rest before it's ready to fire again. Now let's make one thing clear. An action potential and a nerve impulse are not exactly the same thing, though they are closely connected. An action potential is a single electrical event, a brief change in the membrane's charge at one point on the neuron. But when that event keeps repeating from one section of the axon to the next, it forms a wave of action potentials traveling along the entire length of the neuron. And the traveling wave is what we call the nerve impulse. You can think of it like a row of dominoes. When one falls, it triggers the next, and the motion continues along the line. Each falling domino represents an individual action potential, while the continuous motion represents the nerve impulse. So, in simple terms, a nerve impulse is nothing but a series of action potentials moving down the axon. That's how your body's electrical language carries information from the receptors to the brain, and then back from the brain to the muscles or glands to make you respond. Muscles or glands to make you respond.